All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Greg. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Philip Mustam, an Einstein Fellow at UC Berkeley right now. And I'm going to be presenting work that we've carried out in the last one and a half years, roughly, on blue waters, on simulating hyper-energetic and super-luminous supernova. This work would not have been possible with my many collaborators that I'm listing here on this title slide. Looking at the abstract that I submitted, apparently, to the to the Blue Water Symposium, this is going to be really a whirlwind tour of like what can I cram into like an 18 minute plus two talk, so this is going to be interesting. Um, just to start off and to kind of motivate a little bit, why do we care about core collapse supernova? So these are important for galaxy evolution and feedback. They produce some of the heaviest elements in the universe via nucleosynthesis. They are also the birth sites of compact objects, namely black holes and neutron stars, which recently got a lot of attention by the advanced LIGO um, detection. They also are a site where copious amounts of neutrinos are emitted, as we verified by observing supernova 1987A. So they're really, really important just beyond just figuring out how stars actually explode. Um, on top of that, we're in really an era of unprecedented unpre unpre um, incoming observational data. So we have a lot of wide field time domain astronomy surveys operating currently and being upgraded for future operations that are delivering a wealth of observational data that are challenging the transient models that we currently have established. Um, on top of that, I've just mentioned that advanced LIGO has detected gravitational waves which open a new window into the universe and how we can observe these transient events. At the same time, the computational tools are really at the dawn of the exascale era, so that if we combine all of this knowledge and all of the new tools that we have available, we can really make use of all this data and we have transformative years ahead of our understanding of these events. Um, just to go into like what I'm going to be focusing on mostly today, Hypernova and GRBs, so hypernova, hyperenergetic supernova, are supernova that are an order of magnitude more energetic in their kinetic energy of the ejected material than the regular garden variety core collapse supernova. And so this, this diagram here, the, the branch that I wanna explore is really where you go from iron core collapse through some engine mechanism forming and then instead of going the normal supernova route, and we're going into this extreme sub-branch where we have a hyper-energetic explosion and possibly an additional long gamma ray burst. We have 11 of these long GRB supernova associations that are verified by now, so we know that there's something driving these explosions and these GRBs um, that are the same engine. All of these show relativistic outflows, so meaning material moving at a good fraction of the speed of light. Um, all of these Supernova are stripped envelope, meaning they show no hydrogen and no helium in their spectrum, but not all stripped envelope supernova come with GLBs, so there has to be something in how the engine operates that's really is triggering whether we get an additional GLB or not, or just get a, a what we call a type 1c broadline supernova explosions. They all seem to form low, in low metallicity and low redshift environments. Um, the neutrino mechanism, which we believe is driving 99% of the explosions is not going to be efficient enough in the sense of it can't deliver enough energy to explain these factor of 10 higher explosion energies in the kinetic energy. So we need to have a different mechanism that's driving these hyper-energetic supernova explosions. Another class that recently has gotten a lot of attention are superluminous supernovas. So these are now more luminous in the light curve as we observe them, um, but also some of these events show the same characteristics as in the they are stripped envelopes showing no hydrogen, no helium in the spectrum, show no interaction with a um, circumstellar medium that could explain why they're more luminous. Um, so that there's really this question out there right now in the community, and this is one of the hot topics that's being debated, is there a common engine connecting all of these different phenomena, namely supernova type 1c broadlines, long GRBs, and then the superluminous supernova of type 1c. And that's something that we, with our research, are trying to address like how do these engines form? Can there be one explaining all of these? Are there difference in the progenitor parameters that then kind of triggered the engine to behave in a different way? Or are these really different engines driving these different explosions? Um, so just to get everyone on the same page, the basic idea is here that we have an iron core at the end of a massive star's evolution. Basically the star has run out of fuel, it's collapsing down to a proto-neutron star where the collapse is suddenly halted um, by the repulsive part of the strong force. 
and the degeneracy pressure, we form a proto-neutron star, which sends out a shock wave into the star that runs into all of the still collapsing, infalling outer layers of the core and the star. And then this shock wave initially was to believe early on when supernova were proposed to actually explode the star, but it really doesn't since it stars because it runs into all the ram pressure of the still accreting material. So we have this shock wave sitting there as a standing accretion shock at about a radius of like 150, 200 kilometers, and we need to find a way of like reviving that shock wave to actually trigger a successful explosion. And that's really the core collapse supernova problem. I'm going to be specifically focusing mostly on the hyperenergetically driven supernova, which have a different engine than the neutrinos, um, but even in the neutrino case, this is still a question where the details are not yet fully um, ironed out, and I'm, I believe Eric will talk a little bit about this in, in the next talk. Um, so the mechanism for these extreme explosions has actually been proposed already in the 70s, so this is one, one of the, the ways these could go about, whereas you have rapid rotation and a very strong magnetic field driving an explosion that is really a bipolar explosion, a jet-like explosion that is running around, out along the magnetic field that's being wound up along the rotation axis of the star. So really key for this is that you have rapid rotation. Namely, you need a millisecond proto-neutron star forming in the collapse, which implies that the iron core of the star before going, undergoing um, collapse in the beginning had to have a spin period of like a few seconds. This is really like very extreme cases um, and these should be very rare. For the computational challenge of this problem, this is really combining a lot of different things. First of all, you need magnetohydrodynamics to handle the gas and plasma dynamics. You need general relativity to handle the gravity aspect of the problem, being able to handle the iron core collapse to a neutron star, possible later on black hole formation. You need nuclear and neutrino physics to handle the nuclear reactions and the neutrino interactions. And then you need basically a full Boltzmann transport theory to deal with the neutrino transport and how these um, leak out of the star. So this is really all four forces fully coupled. So this is an ideal problem for like a computer like Blue Waters since it's like hugely complex. And even with a machine like Blue Waters, we need to make approximations in some of these sectors to being, being able to efficiently simulate these these events in 3D. Since this is the other problem, like these events are really three-dimensional. So we have rotation and fluid and MHD instabilities that if you simulate them in 2D, for example, are not going to be captured correctly. So really we need to do this in 3D. So what that means is we need cutting edge numerical alg algorithms, we need open source um, software infrastructure that can actually deliver science results on like PETA and exascale computers. So this is really something that's ideal for employing on a machine like Blue Waters. Um, the code that I'm going to be presenting results from today is called um, Einstein Toolkit. So this is an open source community toolkit that can handle general relativistic high energy astrophysics phenomena. I use it mainly to simulate core collapse supernova, but you can also use it to simulate binary neutron stars, binary black hole mergers, and all of these events. So if you're interested, there's a lot of demos um, info, info parfaits and the, the code that you can download at einstein2k.org. So I encourage you to go and check that out if you're interested and this may help your research. Like if we're putting one of these hyperenergetic supernova explosions to work on blue waters and that's what you get out. So this is a 3D simulation, the first 3D simulation we performed this in 2014 where for a good while you actually don't see anything happening and um, this is because in MHD instability the MHD kink instability, which is an M equals one low order instability, um, is actually destroying that initial jet that wants to form, and then it takes a while until we still get a bipolar outflow, but it's not a clean jet as it would be in 2D, um, but it is flowing out along the rotation axis, and it's mainly driven by highly magnetized material that is flowing out from the vicinity of the proto-neutron star that is spinning here in the center of this. The length scale here is like, top to bottom, roughly 2,000 kilometer, to give you an idea that this is happening very much in the inner iron core still. So this is where we were, and then one of the unanswered questions in all of this is, how do we get the magnetic field in the first place to like explain such an explosion? Since what I had not been telling you is that to trigger this kind of explosion, we put on a very, very strong artificial field before we let the star and the, the core of the star collapse. So this is kind of assuming that a lot of processes, a lot of turbulent processes work out as people had been hand waving, namely the magnetorotational instability to trigger small scale field and then a global 
dynamo processor that is ordering this field into like a large scale structure that is needed to drive this explosion. Um, what we then set out, and this was something that we completed at the end of 2015, is do a first global 3D MHD simulation where we actually resolve the magnetorotational instability and then see if, if we start from a more realistic initial seed field on an iron core, but throw the high resolution that is needed to resolve this instability at the problem, do we get what we expect from like all these hand-waving arguments that we had assumed in the previous simulations. And this is what we set up. So this was 10 billion grid points, um, run on 130,000 cores on blue waters in parallel for roughly about two weeks wall time. So this was 60 million compute hours. And compared to like the same time scale that we would simulate in a previous simulation, this is 10,000 10, times more expensive per net unit time evolved in this simulation. And so we did this for four different resolutions from left to right. You're looking at toroidal magnetic field strengths. Anything in yellow and light blue is indicating magnetar strength magnetic field, which is the magnetic field strength that we really need to explain these explosions. From left to right, we're going from 500 all the way down to 50 meter resolution. The 150 meter resolution here on the right are the ones that are resolving the magnetorotational instability. What you see is that there's a lot more turbulence being generated, a lot more small scale field being generated, but also that the small scale field in the highest resolution case is organized into this larger scale structure, which if we compare to our simulation that we had, where we had previously assumed that we put in this field to begin with, this is exactly the structure that we have to, to explain one of these explosions. Um, just looking at the, the high resolution case in detail here, um, so you see as this starts out, there's a lot of small scale field being generated, which then like over time and over multiple spin periods of this proto-neutron star is organized into this strong toroidal extended structure here along the rotation axis of the star, um, which is then actually driving an outflow, which is basically exactly what we needed to explain how we form these jets in the first place when we don't start from an artificially amplified magnetic field already pre-collapse of the iron core. Um, looking at the time scale for the growth, just at um, the very large scale, so this is for different wave numbers. Um, in the Fourier analysis, we see that this energy initially grows exponentially, and even if we then later on assume a more conservative linear growth, uh, we can roughly estimate that this would saturate to equipartition with the kinetic, the turbulent kinetic driving energy in this problem um, within like 50 to 60 milliseconds. So that means that we have about a half second to drive this kind of explosion in most core collapse cases, even for much, much weaker magnetized cases than this one that we used here, this would be enough time to actually amplify the field to that strength. So this really looks like that if you get the rapid rotation on the iron core initially, then you get the magnetic field for free. So this is eliminating one of the constraints for how you trigger like one of these jet driven explosions and rapidly rotating core collapse. Um, on top of that, and this is where a question mark is here, this may show us how you initially start to form a magnetar. I'm not calling this magnetar formation yet, since for that you would need to have poloidal field. We are mostly talking about toroidal field here. You would probably have like this dynamo process um, cycles through multiple cycles to then have this field settled, but this may really show you the first glimpses of how you form a magnetar, which later on in a different kind of problem may also be responsible for a superluminous supernova. Just in the last couple of minutes, let me switch gears here and show you one of the examples how these events actually matter in terms of their observational signatures. And this is focusing on the rapid neutron capture process, which is one of the processes responsible for making some of the heaviest elements in the universe. Um, so these jet-driven explosions have been proposed as one of the sites where you can make these very, very um, heavy elements. The, the other side is like neutron star mergers. Um, the, the key is that you need a very neutron rich environment where if you look at this diagram, you start um, capturing neutrons since the capture rate is so high that you kind of like go in this direction until you've basically captured enough neutrons that you decay back into stability via uh, beta decays. And then you end up back in the valley of stability here with a much, much heavier nuclei than what you started out from. Um, for that, what is key is that you obviously need a lot of neutrons around. Entro high to medium entropy helps um, low density. So these jets, these outflows in these um, simulations that I've shown you before are some of the ideal sites for like having these conditions. 
Um, we extract these kind of the uh, tracer particles that are tracing the uh, tracing the fluid flow and record the thermodynamic quantities that they encounter. Let me just play this movie again. Um, what you see here is like for one of the tracer particles, we then feed this into a nuclear reaction network to post-process and figure out what kind of um, elements do we get out at which abundance. Um, you see how the seeds start out here, then very, very rapidly capture neutrons until they like then rapidly decay back to stability and the abundance pattern you see down here where you have the three characteristic peaks of this uh, rapid neutron capture process. Before, based on 2D simulations, it had been shown that these jet-driven explosions are a robust source of the R process. So this could be um, rivaling neutron star mergers as the source of these um, very heavy elements. When we look at this in 3D and also look at how the neutrinos that are um, also impacting how these, um, how these reactions go about impact this, we find that if we look at something that's a jet explosion that mimics this, the, the 2D explosions that um, have been done previously, that we do find pretty robust R processes, but that it also depends pretty sensitively on the neutrino treatment and the neutrino luminosities that you take into account when you do the nuclear reactions in your network. So what this is showing here is like the same um, distribution of particles, but then fed in different parameterized neutrino luminos luminosities into the nuclear reaction network as we post-process. And then on top of that, we also actually extract the neutrino luminos luminosities from our simulation to give you an idea of where these would roughly fall. So th the idea here is really to parameterize the uncertainty that we have in the neutrino transport part of the problem in our simulations, which probably is only trustworthy to a factor of 10 order of magnitude here, so that we give you an idea of how sensitive in this case, the third peak really is. So basically already in this most ideal case where you get a strong jet out, um, which is mimicking what the 2D, 2D explosions do, um, the third peak elements and the abundance of these will depend on, how, on your neutrino treatment and how you um, take this into account in the nuclear reaction network. This is really due to the YE, so the, the, uh, the electron fraction evolution, which you see in this plot down here, where for the different uh, neutrino luminosities, you see how you reach either very, very uh, neutron-rich conditions or slightly less so, which really play a crucial um, role in how these particles evolve here. Um, so taking this one step further and looking at the more realistic simulations that we had done, where we don't start from this like very artificially high field, um, you see that this gets even less robust for the R process. So the top plot shows you the abundance pattern for again for different neutrino luminosities, um, all the way from like null neutrino luminosity to 10 to the 53 arcs per second. Um, for a, a 10 to the 12 Gauss initial field, so this is the simulation I had shown you in full 3D before. Here we limit it to octant symmetry, which makes it slightly more um, similar to what a 2D simulation looks like. And here you see that already like for 10 to the 53 arcs, for example, um, this actually falls off completely in terms of the second and third peak. If you then go to an actual full 3D simulation, you see that really if you, you only get robust third peak R process, and even for the second peak, it matters now which neutrino luminosity you take into account. So really this is pretty crucial to figure out how this looks like for a full 3D simulation with the realistic neutrino treatment um, to figure out if jet-driven cochlear supernova really can contribute in the early universe to explain some of the R process um, nuclear synthesis that we're seeing in the enrichment of stars. So let me just summarize here. Um, I've shown you that new transient events, hyperenergetic and superluminous supernova specifically challenge the engine models that we have established for these. Uh, we need detailed, massively parallel 3D GMHD simulations to interpret all the observational data that we have coming in right now. Um, I've also shown you as, in a, as one of the examples that magneto turbulence and large-scale dynamo action and rapidly rotating core collapse can explain where the magnetic field amplification for jet formation comes from. And also that robust R process elements seems to only be achievable if we have strongly magnetized iron cores before collapse already. This is what I showed you in this last part. And really what is the underlying message at the end is like high performance computing, especially blue waters level high performance computing is key to understanding all these puzzles. Thank you very much.